Good morning, everyone. Mr. O'Neill here. We're, today we're going to talk about forces. We're going to talk about Newton's second law in detail and explore our knowledge about forces and to a little bit higher level than what we did on the introduction. Specifically, we're going to talk about Newton's second law. Newton's second law is that an ob the force on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. So if you were to rearrange this, you would be able to see that the acceleration is going to equal to the force divided by the mass. In other words, an object's acceleration is directly proportional to the force applied to the object and inversely proportional to its mass. So that's Newton's second law I'll come up with by this fellow here. We're going to explore it in a little more detail and then you're going to demonstrate your knowledge by doing a worksheet. So we talked about net forces, balanced and unbalanced forces. When the forces are balanced, the net force is zero and the ob object's acceleration doesn't change. However, if you have unbalanced forces, you apply a net force, what's gonna happen is that the object's gonna accelerate. It will change direction, speed up, slow down, do something. And it'll do so according to this formula right here. So when you figure force is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. The mass is in kilograms. We talked about kilograms, about 2.2 pounds. The acceleration is going to be meters per second per second or meters per second squared, same thing. Here's some examples. So if you take a certain amount of force, keep a constant amount of force and you push on something, enough to overcome the static friction and make it sliding friction. If you push a brick, then what's going to happen is the amount of force that you apply, in this case 72, it's measured in something called Newtons, divided by the mass of the object, and the brick weighs about, I guess they're so, assuming these are six kilograms, that would be a heavy brick. But, and if you apply 72 newtons and it's divided by the mass of six kilograms and it's going to get an acceleration of 12 meters per second. Uh, similarly, if you take the same amount of force, 72 newtons, and you push two brakes, two brakes are going to have twice the mass and you're going to get less acceleration. So you take the force divided by the mass and you get half, half of the uh, one brake amount of acceleration. It's going to accelerate less. And following the same logic, if you have three bricks with a mass of 18 kilograms, apply 72 newtons divided by 18, it's going to accelerate even less. So that's an example of the application of Newton's second law mathematically to figure out the acceleration on an object. You simply take its force, the force applied to it, we're talking about the net force, divided by the object's mass. So there's a unit that goes with this called Newtons. That is the unit, it's abbreviated capital N. And a Newton is equal to a kilogram times a meter divided by a second squared. That's the units that we measure force with. For example, in America we use foot pounds, but if you were to go to a mechanic in Europe, they're going to measure the force that they use on a torque wrench with newtons. So forces are measured in newtons, and because we use the SI units, we're going to use newtons for measuring force in here. So that's what a newton is. It's a kilogram meter per second squared in terms of its units. Next, I want to talk about weight. So this is often you misused. I even misuse it myself all the time. But there's a difference between weight and mass. So weight is the force when a mass is subject to a gravitational field. For example, I weigh, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I weigh about 220 pounds, which just as it works out about 100 kilograms. You wanna know what 100 kilograms looks like? Look at me. So that's my weight. Now to figure that, you know, my mass would be 10 
kilograms or whatever. And then I'm going to be multiplied by Earth's gravitational field, which is about 10 meters per second squared. So when I step on the scale, my mass subject to gravity is going to make that scale go down. If I were in space, I wouldn't weigh nothing. I would still have the same mass, but I wouldn't have any weight. It'd be weightless. So that's what weight is. You take mass times gravity. Oh, by the way, that's uh, gravity. If I go to China, if I go to Europe or whatever, I'm going to have the same weight because I'm on the same planet. Same planet, same gravitational field, 10 meters per second squared. Good morning. So, however, if I were to go to the moon, the moon has less mass than the Earth, about one-sixth of the mass of the Earth. So it turns out that gravity is one-sixth what it is on Earth if you go to the moon. So everybody's going to be like Michael Jordan, jumping and having strength. Because the amount of weight you have is a lot less on the moon. For example, if you weigh 420 newtons on Earth, you're going to weigh one-sixth of that on the moon. You would take 420 divided by 6 and you get about 70. So if I were on the moon, Weigh 420 here, go to the moon, weigh 70 newtons, I'd be super strong. So, an example of how this could be applied is they're going to figure the mass on the moon if your mass is 41 and a half kilograms here. Well, you don't even need a calculator for this because mass doesn't change. Mass is how much resistance to inertia you have. So my mass is the same on Earth as it would be on the Moon. The only thing that would be different is the weight changes because the gravity is different. So the answer to this question would be 41.5 kilograms. So we started to talk about friction, we started to talk about fluid friction, and we started to talk about air resistance. Now I'm going to talk a little more detail about air resistance. So if you have an object that's falling through the air, it's going to be acted on by two forces, at least two forces. The first force is going to be gravity. Gravity is going to be pulling that object down towards the center of the earth. The other force that's acting on it is fluid friction, in particular the friction or air resistance of the object pushing against the object as it falls. So you got two forces acting on an object falling through the air. Gravity and air resistance. And there's all kinds of science goes into studying this. So looking at it graphically, here's an individual who's falling through the air, he's a skydiver. So he's got a force going down due to gravity. You could even say weight, abbreviated capital W. And then there's some air resistance forcing the individual up. Obviously, he's not floating. The air resistance isn't higher than the gravity is. The gravity is higher. But because these forces are going in the opposite direction, this one's going down. Because they're going in the opposite direction, you subtract them. So the net force is going to be equal to the force of gravity minus the air resistance. And obviously he's going to fall towards the earth because the gravity is greater than the amount of air resistance. There's all kinds of dynamics that happen. We're going to go over exactly what happens when something falls through the air. And in particular, is at some point as you accelerate, the amount of air resistance gets higher and higher and higher. You've seen the videos of the skydivers jumping out of the plane as they fall. They get more and more air resistance and they speed up as the gravity pulls them towards the Earth. At some point, the amount of air resistance is exactly equal to gravity. At that point, it's called terminal velocity. 
So if you jump out of here, well, this guy's in trouble. He ain't got no parachute. But if you jump out of a helicopter, at some point you're accelerating towards the Earth due to gravity, but the amount of air resistance is pushing you back up. So at some point you'll e reach equilibrium and you'll stay at that velocity. That's called terminal velocity. So if you were to, to look at the dynamics, the physics of the situation and solve for acceleration, say this individual has a, a net force of 1,000 newtons, and he weighs 100 kilograms, then his acceleration is going to be equal to 10 meters per second squared down towards the center of the Earth. And we know everywhere on Earth it's 10 meters per second squared, so that's no surprise there. In other words, when something falls, air resistance acts in the opposite direction as gravity and the direction that the individual is moving. So there's three things that determine air resistance. The first is uh, the speed of the object. As it speeds up, you get more air resistance, more friction from the fluid flow, the air flow across the individual. So higher the speed, the more resistance you get. The next is the size. A little person will have less air resistance than a big person. No offense to the little people. The other is the shape. You know, uh, for example, if I curl myself up into a ball, then I'm going to fall very fast. But if I spread myself out, my size goes up, and that's going to create more air resistance. So that's the reason when you see these skydivers, sometimes they'll spread out and become as large as they can so that they fall slower. They speed up, and you see movies like somebody falls out, and then Superman, whatever, makes himself small to the air resistance, and he speeds up and catches a person before they hit the ground. So, an interesting thing, you know, the shape, the weight of things shouldn't affect the speed at which it falls, theoretically. But the air resistance sure does. A big feather will, will fall slower than a little feather, believe it or not, because the amount of air resistance is larger. The same thing happens with leaves. If you have a big leaf, it's going to fall slower than a, than a small leaf. Or a pointy leaf will fall faster than a big broad leaf that catches a lot of air. And similarly, if you take a piece of paper and drop it, You know, if it's spread out, it's going to fall slow. But if you wad it up, it's going to have a lot less air resistance, and it'll fall faster. So the shape affects how fast things fall. Doesn't have anything to do with how heavy the object is. The paper had the same mass, the same weight. When I had it spread out, it's when I folded it up. That's kind of a counterintuitive a fancy word for me that it doesn't make any sense. You would think if the human mind would say a heavy object would fall faster. So what do you guys think? Would a heavy object fall faster than a light object? Yeah, so I got one yes and one no. Hmm. So it turns out uh, in order to test this, you would have to be in an environment with no air because the effect of air resistance would, would throw the experiment off. Can anybody think of a place without any air? Did you say the moon? Yeah. Yeah, so let's check it out. So man's been to the moon. And some guys went up there. And I'm going to show you a brief video. Of some guys on the moon testing this experiment. They got a heavy object and a light object. They're going to drop them at the same time. Are you ready? So here's some astronauts on the moon.
that in fact, the mass of an object doesn't have anything to do with how fast it falls. The only thing that makes a difference is that amount of air resistance, which has to do with those three things, the speed, the shape, and the size. So we talked about this already. There's some point when an object's falling, when the force of gravity is exactly equal to the air resistance. zero, then it stops accelerating, so it just reaches its terminal velocity. So when you fall in, that's as fast as you can go, right? Unless you make yourself small or something. The skydivers are really good at making themselves small, pointing themselves into the air to speed up, etc. And by slowing themselves down, not only do their, their ride last longer, if you would, but they're slower when they pull the parachutes, less force, and they get pulled back by the parachute. And also they're going slower, the parachute slows everything down so that when they hit the ground, they're not break their legs and all that stuff, usually. There's all sorts of science goes into skydiving. So at the start of his jump, the air resistance is zero because he has no speed, right? He just comes out of the plane and going zero meters per second. But as the skydiver falls towards the earth, uh, she speeds up, accelerates downwards. As the speed increases, the air resistance increases more. You can see this arrow gets bigger as the speed goes up. Eventually, they're equal to each other. And since the acceleration is zero, you got a constant velocity. Imagine what happens. He's falling, you know, and he decides, okay, I'm close enough to the ground that I'm going to pull the parachute. Boom, blows out above him. Now the amount of the size, the amount of air resistance is a lot larger, right? So you have more surface area, more, way more air resistance. What happens is that now compared to gravity, uh, slows him down because the air resistance is greater than the gravity at that moment until it reaches equilibrium again. So at some point, the air resistance with the parachute deployed is going to be equal to gravity again at some lower speed, right? So V goes down, velocity goes down, and the force of the air goes down until it's equal to gravity again. And at that point, the net force is equal to zero, and the acceleration is equal to zero at a lower speed. So that's good, because when you hit the ground, you don't want to be going as fast as you are when you, the wind's blowing over you and you're way up in the sky. That's gonna be the gravity, uh, this force of gravity is equal to weight, often used W, just the mass times the gravity. So your final terminal velocity with the parachute deployed is lower than the initial velocity when you're dropping through the sky before you deploy the parachute. Okay, and you can see, you know, that as he comes out of the plane, his speed goes up until he reaches terminal velocity, his terminal velocity here. 
right? And he just falls at that constant speed. Once the parachute deploys the parachute, he slows down because the air resistance is greater in gravity in this with this high speed, but the, the air resistance goes down as the person slows down until they reach a speed at which the air resistance is equal to gravity again at a lower speed. So, and then of course they hit the ground. All right. A lot of times they'll roll or run all kinds of techniques that skydivers use to keep from breaking their legs. Does everybody understand this? Good. So I got a question for you. Why would a skydiver want to lay out flat versus falling standing up? Hmm. What do you think, Kelly? Makes it more slower. Yeah, so more air resistance, make me larger more air resistance, and it makes the velocity go slow. And it's like if he falls up, it's like crumpling that piece of paper, it's gonna fall faster. Good answer. And I believe that'll be it. So that covers forces. We talked about air resistance in detail. We talked about terminal velocity. We talked about net force again. So now I got some uh, work for you guys to do and uh, we'll submit it to our learning management system. Thank you.